Good morning, everyone, and welcome back as we continue the Governor's Opioid Response Webinar series. My name is Josh Miller, and I am the Opioid Response Project Manager out of the Office of Behavioral Health. We have a great presentation today, which will focus on the intersection of brain injuries and substance use disorder. Presenting will be Dr. Carolyn Lemsky with Community Head Injury Resource Services and Steve Wade, who will be moderating, and he's with the Brain Injury Association of America. I'd like to remind everyone to please use the Q&A section to ask questions. We always try our best to answer all questions during this one hour time frame. However, that's not always possible. We'll make sure to respond to your questions that don't get answered after this webinar and update them on the Ad Care Summit webpage. We won't have a webinar next month. Instead, we will have a live event. I know, that's very exciting. The title is An Evening with Journalist and Author Sam Canones, a lively and active discussion on opioid policy in Maine and across the country. Please join us on this special evening where Governor Janet Mills will interview acclaimed author and journalist Sam Canones. Following this interview, there will be a panel discussion. Additionally, Points North Institute will continue its series, Recovery in Maine. We will show the documentaries of recovery in Washington County, along with recovery in Androscoggin County. This event will take place on the University of Southern Maine campus at the Abraham Center on Wednesday, April 6, from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. I will now introduce Steve Wade. Steve is the Consulting Executive Director of the Brain Injury Association of America for the Maine chapter. He also is the executive director of the Brain Injury Association of New Hampshire. Mr. Wade has 30 years experience in organizational development and team building for the brain injury communities throughout New England. He received the National Leadership Award for the Brain Injury Association Professional of the Year by his peers. Without further ado, I'll pass it over to Steve. Well, thank you very much, Josh. And welcome everyone. I, on behalf of the Brain Injury Association of America Maine chapter, I wanted to thank uh, Josh and his team, the Opioid Response Program, AdCare, uh, for the opportunity to present this webinar on the intersection of brain injury and substance use and overdose. There is some really exciting efforts currently going on in the state to raise awareness of this issue and trying to build the capacity of community-based organizations to uh, support folks uh, who are struggling with brain injury as a result of substance use and overdose. And um, it's a really, again, a really nice partnership. It's between the Office of Aging and Disability Services, the Brain and Spinal Cord Injury, excuse me, the Acquired Brain Injury Advisory Council for Maine, as well as the Brain Injury Association of America Maine chapter. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carolyn Lemsky. Dr. Lemsky is a board certified neuropsychologist with over 25 years experience working in rehabilitation settings in the US and Canada. She is the clinical director at the Community Head Injury Resource Center of Toronto, which is a ministry of health and long-term care funded agency designed to promote community reintegration of persons living with acquired brain injuries. For the past 15 years, she's been the director of the Substance Use and Brain Injury Bridging Project and a research and knowledge transfer initiative funded by the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. Along with her partners at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, she has provided over 70 workshops and webinars for addictions and brain injury providers across the US and Canada. Uh, one of their key uh, products has been a brain injury toolkit, which was funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration Technology Transfer Centers. In addition to frequent conference presentations, Dr. Lemsky has contributed book chapters and articles to the neuropsychology and brain injury literature. And she is currently the adjunct professor in the Department of Psych Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. So Dr. Lemsky, welcome, and we look forward to your presentation. Uh, you know, thank you very much. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, uh, that I, I guess one of the things that I'll say in terms of um, how I come to this is I am a clinical neuropsychologist. I've been working in tertiary medical centers, working with people who 
were living with the effects of acquired brain injury. And when I moved up to Canada, um, I started to work with folks in the community. And I kind of came into addictions kicking and screaming. I really didn't uh, have any awareness that, <laughs> it's 30 years ago now, of, of the uh, intimate connection between substance use and brain injury. So this is a topic that um, has become near and dear to my heart, mostly because my clinical work has shown me how essential it is to understand what this intersection is. So um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you uh, about some of what we have learned um, about substance use and acquired brain injury. Um, I know uh, from looking online that Maine has been hit hard very much the same way that Ontario has. And I also know that um, Maine has mounted a very robust response uh, for prevention and intervention. And what I'm gonna be talking about today is the fact that, that um, a lot of fatal overdoses have been avoided because of those efforts. And what I was able to lift off of line were some data from May, 2021. And um, I'm just gonna kind of use this as an example, doing a little bit of a deeper dive into those data. We see that there, unfortunately, there were uh, 48 fatal overdoses in Maine um, in May, 2021. But that was kind of the tip of the iceberg um, because there were 571 non-fatal overdoses in that same month. 313 of those were seen in emergency rooms, 157 were attended by EMTs, and there were at least 101 community reversals. And if you, like me, work in the community with folks who have um, significant difficulties with opioid use, you know that that 101 number may just be the tip of the iceberg because so many uh, reversed overdoses don't get reported um, officially. So what that means in May there, uh, 2021, just as an example for every fatal overdose in Maine, there were 13 non-fatal overdoses. Um, now, what we know from multi-site studies and um, this uh, college at all reference is actually a meta-analysis looking at the combined uh, results from uh, a number of studies, both in North America and Europe. We know that about 20% of people who use opioids are at risk for an episode of overdose every year. And each non-fatal overdose comes with a new risk of neurocognitive impairment. What we also know is that a history of traumatic brain injury, and this is something that a part of the story that will kind of be woven in as we go, increases the risk of fatal overdose by about threefold. Uh, and it's not just a one-way causal relationship. So for today, uh, we only have an hour together. Um, I'm going to try and just use the hour to increase awareness of the intersection between overdose-related cognitive impairment and other acquired brain injuries and their potential impact on service delivery. We're going to talk a little bit about, in a very sort of high-level way, you know, big overview, the effects of hypoxia and anoxia associated with opioid use and overdose. And what I'm hoping to do is provide, and this will probably be a really quick again, high level overview of the essential skills that are required to address neurocognitive impairments in the people that you're serving. We know that you're, you're working at this in a variety of different settings with very different resources, very different kinds of personnel. Uh, there may be some physicians who are watching who are working in uh, medical clinics designed to work with people who have um, opioid use disorders, uh, methadone clinics, um, and then there may be some community-based programs and even programs serving people who are homeless and marginally housed. Uh, so we, uh, the recommendations that I'm gonna be talking about today are pretty high level um, uh, related to screening and cognitive impairment, or um, screening for brain injury and cognitive impairment, recognizing and compensating for functional impairments, and then program and case management considerations that, that might be necessary. The most important thing I'll probably say today, um, if, or the most important thing I think that's gonna happen is hopefully 
I'll be giving you enough information that you're going to think about what you want to do um, to, to maybe uh, adjust the services that you're providing in your setting. And so probably the most important thing I'll be doing is introducing some free and available training resources so that you, in whatever way you think is appropriate, you can pursue um, making changes um, or additions to your programming. So getting started, you know, let's think about the brain and oxygen use. Your brain makes up only about 2% of your body weight, but it uses about 20% of the oxygen, and about 15% of the blood pumped by your heart. So that's kind of an energy hog relative to other organs in the system. So what are the impacts of respiratory suppression? Well, we're gonna see a little bit of a demonstration of that, but um, hypoxia, which is the term that's used to look at, uh, to, to talk about a reduction in oxygen available to the brain. So that's when um, that oxygen saturation number kind of goes down and there's less available blood oxygen circulating through the body and thus available to the brain. Um, and that can cause temporary memory loss, reduced coordination, inattentiveness, and poor judgment. And when there's an absence of oxygen or anoxia, it can result in coma, seizure, and brain death. Um, I, I just, uh, because I think it's fascinating, we're gonna start out with a little, and hopefully I'll make the technology work here properly, um, a, uh, a video demonstration. Uh, and to find out why, yeah. I'm going to put myself through the same experience. These are the laboratories of Kinetic in Hampshire, operated by Dr. Henry Looper and his team. The room I'm sitting in is a decompression chamber. Any second now, all the air is going to be sucked out of it, leaving me at an equivalent altitude of 25,000 feet. All military pilots have to do this training, so they become familiar with the effects of sudden hypoxia. OK, just confirm you're happy to breathe. Yeah, very happy. Stand by for rapid decompression. In five, four, three, two, one, now. As the pressure drops, the chamber suddenly fogs up as the moisture condenses out of the air. Colder in here now. Some condensation in the cabin. 25,000 feet. While I've still got my breathing mask on, I can function fine at this altitude. So still on oxygen at this point, and the oxygen saturation break there is showing me 99% saturated. OK, you're feeling all well. I'm feeling good. But when the time comes to take my mask off, I'll be suddenly exposed to air with only a third of the amount of oxygen in it. What I would like you to do is drop your mask and then switch the regulator off. This is rapid decompression. Unlike in the mountains, there's no time to acclimatize to the lack of oxygen. And the effects are very different. Whilst initially, I can easily perform normal functions like writing my name and address, my blood oxygen levels are falling dramatically. Quite alarming that drop in oxygen saturation went straight down. We're still going down. How are you feeling? Because you're already looking slightly pale in the face now. Yeah, I'm feeling tingling in my hands at the moment. A little bit lightheaded. And within a couple of minutes, I'm struggling to perform even simple tasks. So you've got four blocks here. What I'd like you to do is try and make these blocks match the silhouette that you see on the card there. Right. <laughs> but although I was struggling to perform these tasks, I really didn't care. The overriding sensation I was feeling was one of euphoria and well-being. But after three minutes, I can't even write properly. I'm now in great danger and not even registering anything that's said to me. And we need to take some corrective actions now. What I'd like you to do is lift the mask up to your face, Kevin. Lift the mask up to your face. Lift the mask up to your face, Kevin. And I will do that for you. What I need you to do now is just take long, slow, gentle breaths. So what you can see in that example um, is a pretty good overview of the um, effects that you might see as the result of um, 
a loss of oxygen to the brain. And what's really kind of remarkable here is that it's a silent hypoxia. He's not struggling for breath. He's, he doesn't, he's not aware of the, the fact that there's less oxygen getting to the brain and that he's, his, he's aware perhaps that he's having difficulties, but there's an overall sense of euphoria. Uh, and, <clears throat> and what this gives you uh, is kind of a little bit of a sense for um, how difficult it is to be aware of the cognitive changes and to be uh, sufficiently concerned about the cognitive changes that might be occurring in order to um, make uh, adjustments for them which really kind of highlights the need for clinicians to be aware of the potential impacts of hypoxia and anoxia and uh, be actively screening for those. So what's actually happening here is that there's damage to vulnerable structures. And some of the structures that are most vulnerable are the ones that are the biggest energy hogs in the brain, the ones that use the most glucose and the most oxygen to do their work. One of those structures is the hippocampus. It's a memory uh, structure that's deep in the temporal lobes. And the job of the hippocampus essentially is to make the connections between sensory and cognitive inputs so that we, um, we have the experience of having a coherent memory. So it's sort of an indexing system, if you will, that allows us to uh, pull together information in the form of a memory. We know that the basal ganglia and the globus pallidus are also really um, uh, structures that are really vulnerable to damage. And basically those are, they run through the middle of the brain. Um, they, they're sort of densely packed with um, neuronal tracts. And what they are essentially is a switching station for sensory information and coordination. So that's what enables your brain to be able to take information, organize it, and then act on it um, using all of the different functions of the brain together. And we know that changes in white matter often occur. There's a leukoencephalopathy or white matter disease that shows up on imaging, for example, in chronic opioid or heroin use. Um, and that's also related to hypoxia or anoxia in the long run. There might be an immediate change in um, white matter visible, but then there are also um, delayed or long-term kinds of problems that you are uh, changes that can happen in the weeks to months following an anoxic or hypoxic episode where um, further deterioration in the abilities uh, the, of the brain to sort of communicate one structure to the other. And that's in large part what the white matter is responsible for is connecting all of those um, areas of the brain so that it can function in a coordinated fashion. So we know that with hypoxia and um, and anoxia, there are changes to these vital structures related to memory and overall coordination of brain functions and also motor functions. Um, the cerebellum um, at the back of the brain is also um, a heavy user of uh, oxygen and glucose, and it also can be affected, creating um, problems with movement. And when there's an absence of, uh, of um, oxygen to support the functions of the brain, seizures and death. Those changes can occur between three to six minutes. Um, and as we'll talk about, it's not just the absence of, of oxygen that's at play uh, in many of the clients that we're serving. So what are the cognitive and behavioral things that you're going to see? Nah, memory loss, slowing, so that, that uh, difficulty coordinating all of the brain functions together. So difficulty processing information, which results in impaired judgment. Um, and sometimes it's subtle, just devaluing the, um, the need to delay gratification and being very, very impulsive and keyed into um, immediate gratification. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that happens. Changes in mood and personality that might be observed as irritability or depression, in some cases kind of um, confusion or, or, or a lack of focus. We know that visual spatial functioning um, often deteriorates. So a person will have more difficulty with the kinds of tasks that you saw in the video, um, doing constructions or finding your way around complex environments. And planning and problem solving can also be affected in very much the same way as you saw in that video. 
some of the impacts um, if the hypoxic episode was relatively brief and relatively recent um, might be fairly subtle. And the individual may not even be aware that they're ha happening. They're still able to talk, they're still able to um, communicate, but as you saw, may be less able to understand the need to um, register and complete a command uh, and, um, and, and just may demonstrate generally poor, poor judgment. And then on the polar extreme, if a person's been hospitalized and in coma for a long period of time, the cognitive impairments may be uh, very significant and very severe. We also see sensory motor impairments that may be subtle, like you know, a little trouble writing or a little trouble with manual dexterity, or they may be um, more obvious and result in a longer term change in the way a person walks or ataxia, the kinds, same kinds of motor impairments that you might see with intoxication. We know that people sometimes have visual, uh, vision changes that it might include um, blurriness. Um, sometimes um, blindness can result depending on how severe the anoxia was and whether it affected the, the cranial nerves associated with vision um, or uh, the visual cortex and um, reduced hearing for the same reason, whether it's the auditory nerve that's affected or um, some of the cortical structures that interpret auditory information and then just slower, slower processing. Um, this is, um, if, you're, if you're interested in doing a deep dive, uh, and there's a recent review out that has um, kind of an exhaustive review of the papers that have looked at the actual neurocognitive impairments of, um, that are resulted from um, overdose. But one I think the most um, interesting findings that they have is that you can't look at just the overdoses, you have to look at all the other things that are potentially having an impact on this person including the neurotoxic impacts of the opioids themselves and other drugs that may be used by that individual and how those drugs affect memory and executive functioning. <clears throat> and we also know that this is a group that may, um, because of their substance use habits, put themselves at risk for different kinds of chronic infections, including HIV and hepatitis. And as we'll talk about a little later, perhaps encephalitis or brain abscesses. And so those are other potential sources of neurocognitive impairment. And then, as I alluded to before, there's that risk of traumatic brain injury that seems to be elevated in this group, whether it's... Um, it's because of their previous history of brain injury or because their intoxication has made them more susceptible to sustaining new injuries. And then there's the possible additive effect of these multiple overdoses. We know that one overdose puts you at risk for future overdoses. Now, I'm not gonna get a chance because we only have the hour um, to really do a deep dive here into what cognitively is happening in the brain as the result of both the substance use and the anoxia. Um, but if you're working in the addictions field and you took a course perhaps in the impacts of substance use uh, on the brain, you probably saw an illustration like the one on the right hand slide, right hand side of this slide, uh, that, that looks at the neuroanatomy of reward. And we know that most substances of abuse have their greatest impact on the dopamine tracts, the dopamine being the major neurotransmitter that's involved in the perception of a pleasure or reward. And what, um, what I would point out here is, is that we know that the use of opioids has particular effects on those structures. The constant exposure of the brain to these unnatural levels of opioids such as are produced when you use an opioid substance, you use an opioid and you get this huge shot of um, uh, dopamine that is many times what would naturally occur with the normal reward like food or sex or an enjoyable activity. And so the brain adapts to the, that, that unnatural um, amount of opioids by, by um, causing some opioid receptors to recede. The end effect is, is that there's a blunting of reward for normal activities. Now that's probably something that's a familiar concept to most of folks, most of you folks. Um, research has shown us that um, 
what, what this process also does is it limits the growth of um, neurons in the hippocampus, that memory making machinery, that, that structure that helps to index our memories. And what's happening there is that, you know, our brains are designed to focus on those things that are most enjoyable and most reinforcing. In a perfect world, those would also be the things that are healthiest for us. That's unfortunately not the world we evolved in, but that is the world we are living in now, uh, is, is uh, one where the reinforcing effects are sometimes very much in contradiction with what is healthy and good for us. And so we have that narrowing of focus to those things that seem to be most reinforcing. And that, that results in that kind of tunnel vision that we often see in our clients where um, they may know a lot of information about the opioids and how to, how to obtain them. And they're exquisitely sensitive to those, those, um, those memories that, that, that act as triggers. And they may have much more difficulty in remembering other types of information um, because their blunted reward system has made them less sensitive to the need to remember the, that sort of information. Um, and, and we know that you know, the blunting has made some, re, um, some information or some kinds of experiences um, much more rewarding. And we know that there's damage to the frontal lobes. Now, what, what do the frontal lobes do? Well, they're responsible for providing um, some leadership in the brain and um, doing that sort of top-down regulation of all of those drive states. So our brains are responsible for planning and um, interpretation of what actually is good for us, sometimes delaying gratification and definitely um, regulating emotion. And that top-down regulation of our frontal lobes can be directly impacted by the substance use itself and then further impaired by the episode of episode of anoxia. Other sources of neurocognitive impairment, you know, if, if polysubstance use is associated with an increased risk of stroke, um, again, infectious diseases, and then also the toxicity of other substances, perhaps stimulants um, like methamphetamine, which we know has a horrible impact on the white matter, uh, causing its own kind of uh, leukoencephalopathy. Now, why is traumatic brain injury and um, other kinds of substance uses so closely linked? There's a lot of information that I could present here, but very briefly, uh, intoxication increases the risk for falls and other episodes like um, aggression and violence that increases the risk of having a brain injury. Each fall or overdose increases the likelihood of neurocognitive impairment. And the nature of brain injury, as we're gonna talk about in just a second, um, and the kind of outcomes you get from brain injury, even if it occurs early in life, may make you more susceptible to substance use and substance use disorders. And we know that there's a strong link between um, brain injury and mental health, particularly anxiety and depression, <clears throat> but also um, thought disorders that can sometimes be diagnosed as, as psychotic disorders uh, and other changes um, in, um, in behavior that may appear to be or, or have the same characteristics as say personality disorders, all of those things can worsen after acquired brain injury. And the cognitive and mental health consequences of brain injury often will make it more difficult to engage in and to benefit from the care that you're trying to provide. There's a lot of populations that are highly at risk acquired brain injury, and these include um, substance users, as we talked about, people who are in the military um, who may be having um, specific brain injuries related to their service, but also a lot of subconcussive as a result of blast uh, exposures, um, athletes uh, who may have recognized concussions, but also a lot of subconcussive blows um, that may result in longer term issues, um, people with a previous TBI. Um, having one TBI puts you at two and threefold risk at having future TBIs and or traumatic brain injuries and being homeless or marginally housed. And I'll highlight this as something that I know is affecting a lot of the folks that are being served in um, programs designed to address opioid use disorders. Um, there's um, a lot of attention being paid, particularly over about the past 
uh, five or 10 years about the strong intersection between homelessness and opioid use disorders. This is one very recent paper that talks about uh, the, the um, frequency of acquired brain injury and, and how often it is occurring and in, new injuries are occurring in this population. Um, but there's also a lot of um, good evidence that um, as many as half of all brain injuries, uh, as many as half of all people who present to programs for, for housing have some significant history of acquired brain injury, and the majority of those occurred prior to the episode of homelessness. Um, in this particular study, we see that about 61% or more had um, a history of, of a traumatic brain injury. What I thought was really most compelling about this was that they have a much higher new annual um, annual incident. So we're in one, in any given year, about 1% of the population will have a concussion. It's 20% of people um, who, are, who are homeless or marginally housed. And one of the things that comes out in that research is that opioid dependence and a previous history of traumatic brain injury are very significant risk factors for that. We know that a, a significant proportion, almost 10%, are opioid related of those new brain injuries. Um, most of them are related to intoxication, and um, a lot of them are moderate injuries or severe injuries, about 20%, which we would anticipate would have lasting neurocognitive impairments beyond the immediate, um, beyond the immediate blow or concussion. Now, it's a whole other huge area of research is what is the impact of traumatic brain injury on the developing brain? And a big overview kind of maybe oversimplification, but certainly is true that early insults, if they occur at the right point in development, can have an outsized effect later on as the brain develops. Uh, and this seems to be true, particularly in like three to five-year-olds and then in early adolescents, when there's a big, either a big pruning happening in the brain to make the brain more efficient or a big um, explosion of, of the development of new tracks. So, uh, we know that apparently mild injuries in childhood, um, when we look at longitudinal data following these kids into adulthood, increases their risk for mental health disorders, substance use disorders, legal involvement. Um, they tend to have lower educational uh, attainment. And then also, as we were talking about homelessness. So, I mean, like if we summarize this, and there's a bit of a bottom line here, it's that if you screen for brain injury in the people that you're serving, it's a marker for complexity. It's going to tell you that they're at much higher risk for mental health issues, um, complex substance use disorders, and, um, and a greater need for uh, perhaps repeated episodes of care. We know that about 75% of people who show up in concurrent disorders programs uh, have a history of significant brain injury, um, more than one with loss of consciousness, which usually or often means that there is some change in behavior and cognition that's lasting. We know that brain injury is associated with more and more severe psychiatric symptoms. And, and I think, and this is a finding that um, has has. Uh, been persistent in, in, as long as I've been practicing, that there's about a threefold risk of increased suicide after a brain injury. Um, mild brain injuries in adolescents also carry that risk for uh, increased risk of suicide. And, and it's strongly associated with other social determinants of health. So the folks that you're working with who are impoverished, who are having difficulty with housing or socially isolated, all of those things are um, a perfect storm for increased history of uh, brain injury. So, you know, it's, it's prevalent in the people that you're serving, probably no matter which setting you're serving them in, uh, if you're working with folks who have substance use disorders. It's about a lifetime incidence, uh, now we're talking about, it's about one in five in the general population of concussion. I've had one, most people, um, uh, Many, many people have had it. I think it's the majority of people of us have had some blow that we would describe um, as a mild traumatic brain injury. That's increased to about, uh, that's, that's certainly much more um, prevalent and multiple injuries are much more prevalent. It's about half of people who are seeking substance use disorders, about half of psychiatric inpatients. And it's a whopping three quarters of people who are um, seeking services for concurrent disorders. Now, 
I'm showing you that um, reward system thing because I want to point out what the relationship is between the machinery that's involved in addictions and substance use disorders. And what you can see on this um, illustration is that the pattern of brain injuries, traumatic brain injuries, isn't random. Because of the way the brain sits in the skull, the frontal lobes and superorbital frontal lobes are really the most vulnerable structures. And when the brain twists or shakes, it's that column in the middle um, that connects those structures, the striatum, that is also highly at risk for what we call axonal shearing or the, the shearing away of connections within the brain. So um, very predictably, the pattern of brain injury is also affecting all of those structures that are involved in executive functioning and, and organizing our behavior and its connections to the emotional machinery that's deeper and the memory machinery that's deeper in our brains. Um, so there's that dorsolateral uh, prefrontal cortex that's at risk for planning and organization and all those intellectual things that we do to keep ourselves organized. And then the superorbital cortex right above the eyes that is responsible for, for um, things that we would describe kind of as personality, like the ability to manage emotions, the ability to recognize social cues and to use social cues. And knowing that those structures are more vulnerable and knowing that, um, knowing that they really do overlap with all of those structures that are related in um, uh, dopamine distribution and are more vulnerable to the effects of, of opioid use disorders, you can see how the combined impact really does create a complex and kind of, um, well, a perfect storm for complexity. So now um, with about probably 10, 15 minutes left to talk, I have to talk, tell you what are we gonna do about this, All right? So what helps? Well, screening for brain injury. And we talk about history of brain injury, but also including um, overdoses so that you have an idea of what is this person's likelihood of having neurocognitive impairment. And then the next thing is functionally assessing for that cognitive impairment that, or, or that difficulty in getting along and doing activities of daily living making accommodations for that, and then intervention in referral. And what, I mean, it sounds like a really tall order. And in fact, it is a very tall order. Um, but what we've tried to do is to think through strategies that will allow you to, um, uh, knowing as well you do, the settings that you're working in and the circumstances that are most relevant to the clients that you're serving um, how to implement these different kinds of um, uh, recommendations. So the first recommendation is for routine screening for brain injury and other sources of neurocognitive impairment. And depending on your setting, that screening process will look different. If you're in a medical setting, it may, may make sense to do a full screen with full history. If you're working in a shelter setting, for example, your screening may be looking for those people who have um, the outward signs that perhaps they're struggling with their cognition and then doing a screening or doing a very simple screening for all, all comers. Um, and so familiarizing yourself with the different kinds of screening, screening, um, screening uh, methods, um, and I'll tell you how you can do that. Learning to recognize behaviors as a result of neurocognitive uh, challenges. Now, in some settings, that may mean actually screening for, for the neurocognitive impairment very specifically and providing very specific adaptations. For other settings, it may be simply being aware of them and having things that the clinician who is working with the client can do in the immediate presence to help them compensate. Um, making programs more accommodating. Again, a wide spectrum of possibility. The most important thing that we can do generally though is to view complexity as a rule. Uh, we are in love with specialization in North America and also in, in some Euros European jurisdictions. And I've, I've spoken with folks in um, like Australia, New Zealand, and they, they suffer from the same problem where we really want brain injury specialists and addiction specialists. What that doesn't help us to do is to develop service structures that integrate those, um, those areas of knowledge for the folks who are presenting with complexity. I know that in Canada, and I know that um, talking to my counterparts in the States, it's very often 
uh, difficult to get um, resources together for folks, depending on what their financial and insurance situation is, or depending on um, the jurisdiction in which they live, which means that we all have to take responsibility, whether we're on the brain injury side of things or whether we're on the addiction side of things, to having enough of a hand in either of those sectors to be able to integrate um, our interventions in, in a sensible and complex, um, sensible way that's evidence-based. So let's start out with the most obvious kind of screening. You know, what does cognitive impairment look like? Well, is your, is your client missing appointments? Are they empathetic? Are they, do they lack empathy? Are they having trouble reading social cues and responding in a way that makes sense given their circumstances? Do they come across demanding or rude? Do they seem to have poor insight? Are they having difficulty managing their emotions? And is there a big gap, and I'm borrowing from one of um, preeminent um, researchers in this field, John Corrigan, when he talks about the gap between say and do. We know that in addictions, it's a really difficult, um, a chronic difficulty to live with, and there's often greater intention than there is the ability to follow through with that intention. But in people who are having neurocognitive impairments, that gap is bigger. So they're having even more trouble with um, following through with what they say that they're going to do. They may seem to lack awareness of the fact that they're not taking notes and they're not really um, actively compensating for any memory problems they might have. They may have followed through and they may come across as very impulsive. So I'll introduce you very quickly um, to just a few screening questions that you can use. Um, and I'll show you where you can get, get um, access to more information about this. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're interviewing about brain injury and a person may not really very fully remember their brain injury, the most important thing to remember is you've got to give them a lot of cues about here's all of the kinds of information I want. So most of these questions have very big stems. They orient the person to um, the kinds of information that will be relevant to talk about. Uh, and so when you're doing these screenings, it's important to stop and think about um, how the questions are written. And when you do the training, if you do the training, um, to use all of the cues that are on those forms to help get a fulsome um, and, and accurate history. So thinking about any injuries that you've had in your lifetime, were you ever knocked out or did you lose consciousness? And if you're gonna be doing this, you're gonna be using um, that full cue that's on the left-hand side of the slide that's kind of saying, you know, um, maybe you had a car accident, maybe you were uh, hit by a car, et cetera. Uh, and then what was the longest um, episode um, that you were knocked out for? And then um, what was the first episode? And those give a sense for um, when you learn how to interpret the results of the screening, how likely it is that they're living with some lasting neurocognitive impairment that might be associated with the history that you're getting. <clears throat> and this is a more formal format uh, for the similar questions that might be appropriate if you're doing say research or if you're, um, if you're um, screening in a more medical setting. It looks like a complex form, but it actually, once you get used to it, if it's a simple history of brain injury, a couple of minutes, if it's a more complex history, maybe up to three or four minutes, uh, to get a full and complete history of a person, uh, person's lifetime history. That does take a little bit of training, maybe about an hour or so to think about it. And that training is freely available. This is one of the sources of training, brainline.org. I use this, this because it's an easier URL to remember. And you can just Google brain injury screening or uh, brain line and you will get connected to the right resources to learn how to do that kind of, kind of screening. Now we know that cognitive impairment in services uh, that treat people for substance use disorders is very prevalent. Um, and a lot of recent research has looked at it. Now, you, know, you can see that on the slide, it says 20 to 70%. That's because different screening methods were used. Um, and, um, you know, uh, and depending on which population, there might be a higher density of folks with neurocognitive impairment. Um, but again, it's higher in people with more complex, um, complex presenting difficulties. And it's about, uh, we know very robustly about two to 20 to 50% in people with alcohol use disorders. Um, 
So one of the things that I'll be doing um, uh, and, and doing more in-depth training about, but you can get your own training freely online, is how to screen specifically for cognitive impairment that's most likely in folks with um, uh, substance use disorder. I used to demure on the topic of cognitive screening because most of the cognitive screenings um, and instruments that are used were actually designed to, to look at dementia, which has a slightly different profile than people who are coming in with neurocognitive impair impairment. But I've been very impressed with how um, our Australian colleagues have developed a specific screening for people for neurocognitive impairment in addiction settings. And then they link that to an intervention um, and very freely available. There are online modules to train people in addiction settings how to implement um, this um, training for their clients. And, and all the materials are free and readily available. And I have Joe Lunn and some of the other, um, and Dr. Barry, some of the, the folks who have been the um, researchers who are really spearheading these things. And they're very eager to see these materials get into the hands of programs that are willing to use them. So they're all freely available and um, they have been vetted and used in, in addiction settings in, in, the, Australian, um, in the Australian context. Um, some of the findings from those programs are that, um, you know, one of the biggest effects that was most impressive is, is that people really liked the training. They felt like it accommodated their needs and they were much more likely to complete their programming. And it kind of paid for itself because if they weren't having about half of the people drop out of inpatient programs before they finish them or, or longer term outpatient programs before they finish them, they were spending less on intake and they were having much better outcomes. Uh, and, and it reduces the rate of cognitive impairment. Now, part of that is re the recovery that occurs during periods of abstinence, but they were definitely seeing improvements in functioning that clients were appreciating. So I think it's a new area, something that we really should be looking at. And there's some great resources to kind of jump on um, and have a look at if your program has the, the capacity to do that. The, um, the um, materials that Steve mentioned earlier are also available free, freely online. This is a resource that we developed with the Mountain Plains um, ATTC, the um, SAMHSA Technology Transfer Centers and MidAmerica. Um, and they together funded this resource. And the resource, and you can see the link to get it, and it's on a page with a, a dozens of other amazing resources in this area. Um, it includes brain basics, um, a more detailed um, kind of dive into some of the things that I've talked about a little bit today, um, screening for brain injury um, and um, functional impairments, recognizing and accommodating cognitive impairments, recommendations for service delivery, and, and, and different resources that you can use. And I have a few screenshots from it to give you an idea about it. It's not a dense, heavy read. Um, but it provides an overview of what we know about um, brain injury and the impacts. Information is, is, is put in tables so that it's easily accessible so that somebody who's not a brain injury provider and maybe have no previous understanding of this stuff can have a look and say, okay, so here's what I'm, uh, here's what the substances that my clients are doing, what kinds of impacts might I expect to have? Um, what, is the, um, what are some of the fine points of implementing screening? We know that in some circumstances, screening for brain injury can be a double-edged sword. If you're, uh, for example, the mom of kids who um, uh, is in perhaps a domestic abuse situation, having a new diagnosis of brain injury might be frightening because what if it prejudices me from maintaining contact um, with my children? And so um, some some um, understanding about how stigma and trauma-informed care should be applied when we're actually doing the screening for substance use. There's other information that's intended to be very specific and, and kind of really practical about, you know, if your client's having trouble getting a message, then, and here's an example of that, here are some simple things that you can do if you're sitting with your client to sort of help them um, to benefit from whatever interaction it is that you're having. We talked a little bit about, and you saw in the, in the video example, that self-awareness and, and the ability to um, understand your own needs um, is, is often an issue with acquired brain injury. So a portion of the tool book 
uh, toolkit is um, devoted to introducing that concept and how to work with people who may not have full awareness of the kinds of things that they are, they are needing. Uh, and then a very big impo uh, important point is how do we provide more structure um, around our clients for um, in, in the environment, in the event that their substance use is continuing, they don't have awareness and they need the environment to be more supportive in order to reduce harms or increase the likelihood that they'll benefit from care. Um, there's a lot of summary information that can serve as reminders to clinicians about some of the information that was provided uh, and then recommendations for, for service delivery. And we know that like these, these recommendations are gonna be different depending on what kind of setting you work in and what your job is in that setting. Uh, and the one thing that I'll um, point out with, point out to here is that we're using um, evidence-based um, interventions or recommendations and tending to skew towards those that are freely and readily available in terms of, in terms of training uh, for frontline clinicians. Um, there's a little bit of a very vanilla, kind of very general care planning thing. And the intention there is to introduce how it, um, care planning, considering your cognitive impairment may be folded into care plans that are already being used in a given setting. Another um, thing that we've worked on, um, and this is, uh, these are the materials that we use in our specialized substance use and brain injury program that we've made freely available with the help of um, the um, National Association of State Brain Injury Administrators. And this is a, it's a client workbook and it's designed to illustrate how you can develop a program that um, accommodates neurocognitive impairment. It's not designed to, to say this is the best way to treat people, but more as an illustration of the kinds of, um, the kinds of memory devices that may be helpful in, in getting some of the typical messages that occur in, in treatment programs across. We find personally that having that physical book present in a person's home, because a lot of our programming is virtual, is, uh, you know, if it's sitting there, it's on the table, it's inviting, uh, that they may actually page through it, and it may remind them of some of the um, key messages that occurred in the sessions. Um, it's an MI adapted approach. It's an update from a previous version um, that was less MI uh, consistent. We use inclusive language. We've had it vetted through um, folks for our um, indigenous populations. And um, up, up in Canada, although I understand that there's a lot of cultural similarities uh, and, um, and, and it's intended to be warm and inviting and informative for the clients. There's brief readings to encourage discussion and reflection. There's also, um, each one has goals, a little bit of information, tips and check-ins. So a person could, using the content of their own program, use a similar format to make their, their um, programming more sort of accessible to folks. And finally, if you're interested in getting involved, um, there is a link, I can put this in the chat if people are interested to, um, to sign up for a listserv. Our listserv is still getting started. Sometimes we wind up um, with too many posts and I'm trying to do it in a, um, a journaled fashion so you only get one a week. Um, but um, it's a place where you could perhaps post questions, find other providers. And we're hoping to link um, in some jurisdictions, ABI providers, with addictions providers so that you can do some cross-training, uh, figure out uh, ways of um, promoting referrals and, um, and, and getting more information about entitlements and that sort of um, good practical information uh, that'll help you to move forward with your clients. Dr. Lemke, I'm so sorry to butt in. Um, this is fantastic. Um, we do have five minutes and we do have some q a i know that you have a couple more slides um to this get is, through but i just wanted to cue you. yeah perfect yeah i think your timing is great um i was gonna just sort of end my formal responses and kind of leave up there for you to look at some you know you could review the materials join the listserv um did you want to um did you want to tell me what some of the questions were or should i be looking in the q a i see there's eight there 
Uh, a common question I'm asked is, can the effects of hypoxia be reversed? There isn't, unfortunately, a treatment to reverse them. Many, if, if in an uncomplicated circumstance, you might find that there might be cognitive impairments that tend to resolve over time because of the brain's natural ability to heal itself. But what we've talked about here is it's typically not a one-off um, and it's typically not the only thing that's happening. In a person who's had an opioid um, overdose, they've also had a brain that's exposed to the toxic effects of opioids. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, there's no medical treatments for that. It's more um, doing things that generally promote brain health. And that is a part of um, the materials, helping people to sleep better, eat better, um, use the right compensation strategies to improve their overall state. And then they may find that the, the functional impairments that are associated with um, hypoxia uh, will be, will be um, improved. But unfortunately, um, Mother Nature does its job when it has a good, um, when it's given an even playing field. And um, the best advice to clients is, is, is whatever is good for your heart is good for your brain. Um, use heart healthy diet, exercise, um, and staying away from substances. And that's the most likely way to maximize the recovery that you're going to see. Why is there a euphoria? Because the frontal lobes are starved of uh, the, the part of your brain. This is my understanding of it is, oh, I'm sorry, I should be clear about the question. The question is, what, can you comment on why there is euphoria? Well, the part of our brain that makes us self-aware is, is not working as, as well as it might. That's, you know, it's a, the very end of our um, blood distribution. It may be the first thing to get starved out um, when these things are starting to happen. So your brain's natural alarm system has been shut off. Um, and, and, that, um, and, and that results in a feeling of well-being because you're no longer, um, you're no longer perceiving potential threats. Um, the next question by Judith is, I witnessed many of these symptoms in my elder clients who were chain smokers, hypoxia, um, and sometimes an elder, elders who chain smoke and likely have CPO, um, CPOD or may be having, um, particularly while they're smoking, um, may be having episodes of hypoxia. Are these brain injury risks and effects unique to opioids? Nope. Um, we know that however anoxia occurs, um, and we know that it's sometimes in domestic abuse situations where there's choking or near choking repeatedly, um, or some, um, you know, um, some practices where an asphyxia is used for pleasure, that, that these effects can also occur. Um, but they're typically most studied with opioids. And again, like I was saying before, it's always confounded with the toxic effects of the opioids themselves. And any link between brain injury and antisocial personalities? And this is probably the last one we can get to. Um, working in the prison system, I, I review num numerous persons who had a history of assault and victims at young ages. Absolutely. And there's a robust literature that talks about the high impact of brain injury in um, our legal systems. And what this has to do with is if, if the superorbital cortex is affected and you can't read social cues, and we find this a lot with the folks in our prison system, um, many people will default to assuming that people are angry. Uh, and I can put um, in, in the UK, there's a, there's a, a researcher uh, who has done a lot of work in youth in the system. Um, in Canada, there's a couple of researchers. So we can post um, some resources about um, uh, resources about uh, brain injury in, in, the, in the correctional system. But yes, there is a very strong link uh, and a growing literature to talk about, in fact, interventions that might be helpful, including uh, making people aware of the trouble that they're having and reading social cues and providing social skills training. That was speed talking, wasn't it? That was fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, it's coherent. That was fantastic. Um, again, these recordings, um, this this presentation is recorded, so folks can see this afterwards. And the questions that we weren't able to get to, um, we will certainly post those answers.
Um, thank you, Dr. Lemsky and Steve for, for presenting um, in this month's webinar, and we will see you all hopefully in person next month in Portland. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Are we off? We are still live. We are still live. I'm just letting people in case anyone wants to go through and look at anything in the chat or anything. Yes. I haven't I haven't closed it yet. I will just shortly though. All right. I'll have a look. Yeah, this was a great presentation and I wish we had more than an hour, but um, that's what we were slotted for and just to be respectful of everyone's time. But once again, thank you so much. Yes. Uh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Scott and I were talking about it that we need to probably create some um, full day webinar or, or in person class on this topic and probably offer it again. We already had that conversation, so we'll be following up. That's, and there's I have some slides um, with resources and, and so I'm going to pull out those slides okay. and um, they will be posted. Can they be posted with the webinar? Absolutely. OK. Yes, we'll, we'll yeah, so that you, you know, any of the, you know, that's the best thing about it are the resources. So you can kind of have a look at those. Yeah. And resources are always appreciated and very much needed. All right. All right. Great job. Take care, everyone. All right. Take care. Enjoy your weekend. I'm going to end. Take care. Take care.